name's Dana. Um, so I'm another one of Andy's PhD students and probably going to be the last of his PhD students to present to you uh, before he gets back. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting uh, the la your very last lecture on concurrency control. Um, so before we start, um, a couple of reminders. The first is that Project 3 is, is due on Sunday, November 17th before midnight. Um, we also released homework four last week, uh, and it will be due on uh, November 13th before midnight. Any questions before we begin? Okay. All right, so um, today we are going to talk about multi-version concurrency control. Um, just make sure I adjust this here. Um, so the first thing I want to point out about multi-version concurrency controls, that its name is a misnomer, and this may ca cause some confusion because it's not actually a concurrency control pro protocol like the ones that you've been learning about in the past two lectures, which are timestamp ordering, OCC, and two-phase locking. Um, rather, it's a way to architect the system uh, when you have concurrent transactions uh, running by maintaining multiple versions. So recall from last week uh, your discussion of optimistic currency control uh, where transactions um, maintain a private workspace and any time they read or wrote to an object, they would copy that object into that private workspace. Um, well, MV multi-version concurrency control is similar to that idea, um, except here instead of having a private workspace um, for each transaction where we maintain these different versions, uh, we're now going to have the versions be part of a global database. Um, and we're going to determine whether some version is, vis is visible to a particular transaction. Um, so MVCC uh, is used by almost every new database system that's been built in the past 10 years or some variant of it. Um, but it's not a new idea. So it actually, um, it's actually decades old. And the first reference to the idea uh, was in a dissertation by a PhD student at MIT in 1978. Um, so it wasn't until the early 80s that the first, uh, that the first implementations of it actually came out. Um, and those came out of a company called DEC, um, and they were called RDB VMS, which stood for Relational Database for VMS, or VAX, which was an old operating system. Um, and the other uh, product was called Interbase. Um, so DEC used to be um, a major computer company uh, it was bought out by Compaq in the late 90s, and then a few years later bought out by HP. So it's no longer around, but um, it did some uh, major pioneering work uh, in database systems. So both our DB, VMS, and Interbase were built by a guy named uh, Jim Starkey, who was also credited uh, as being the inventor of blobs and triggers, so he's a big deal. Um, he later went on to co-found NuoDB, uh, which is a new database startup, and it also happens to use MVCC. So DEC uh, RDB VMS was bought out by Oracle and is now known as Oracle uh, RDB. Um, and, was it? and Interbase um, was eventually sold uh, by DEC. Um, it went through a few different holding companies and finally was open sourced. And so now it's known under a different name. Um, now it's called Firebird. Um, so it may not be as well known as MySQL or, or Postgres, but it's one of the earliest open source databases out there. Uh, and Andy had this little fun fact in there from last year, so I'll go ahead and, and say it. So if, you, if you've ever wonder why the Firefo Firefox web browser is named Firefox, um, it's because they were originally called Phoenix, but then they had to change that name because it conflicted, you know, with another system or another product. Um, so they changed it to Firebird, but then they had to change it again because it conflicted with this database system. Uh, so finally, it was called Firefox. So the main benefit, again, like what you have to understand about MVCC is that writers don't block uh, the readers and the readers don't block the writers. Um, so it's only when you have two transactions uh, 
uh, trying to write tilde object at the same time, they, you have to fall back and rely on one of the concur concurrency control protocols, like two-phase locking. Um, so again, um, you only need to do this when you have a write-write conflict. Um, so with a high level, uh, the way this works is we're going to assign timestamps um, to transactions when they arrive in the system, and then we're going to provide it with a consistent snapshot of the database as it existed at the time that uh, that, that transaction arrived. Um, so this means that they won't see changes from transactions that have not been that have not yet been committed in their snapshot. Um, and just to clarify, uh, this is a virtual snapshot, so it shouldn't be confused with you know, a, a physical snapshot or copying the, the full database to another location and then running that transaction on it. So again, this is, um, this is just virtual. Uh, so MVCC is really useful for read-only transactions because uh, the SQL dialect allows you to declare when a transaction is read-only. Um, and if you do this, then the database system uh, does not require you to get any locks or maintain the read-write sets. Um, and this works, again, because uh, it has a consistent snapshot and will only see the changes that existed at the moment it started. Um, and this makes these read-only transactions really uh, efficient and also really fast to do. Question. Yes? Um, you can, uh, just like um, I mentioned a, a minute ago, like it's, it's essentially just uh, maintaining like a version table or, or version metadata information. And it's very similar to OCC where you understand the read and write sets. And we're going to clearly go over this uh, in, in a lot of detail in the following slides. This is going to be the, the topic of this lecture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, will they read different snapshots, that, uh, snapshots or they read the same one? So it's the, it, we're talking about two reads here. Um, they will read the, the same snapshot, the same version. So snapshot, you know, it, it's uh, more commonly, I think, referred to as the version, you know, of the tuple or database object. When do you bring in a new version of snapshot? Right? Seven, after one minute, or well, can, so if you, so, Bear with me for just like, you know, three minutes, probably less, and we'll actually, that is the first thing we're going to cover. And uh, I'll, I'll answer any other questions you have afterward. All right, so uh, just to finish up on this slide, um, another advantage of MVCC uh, is that you're able to support something called uh, uh, time travel queries. So these are queries that actually let you uh, ask the database system, for example, uh, what was the state of the database, you know, three days ago, three years ago, and using uh, these and using this versioning, they can actually answer these um, these sort of queries. Uh, All right, so the idea of time travel queries was first um, was an idea of Postgres, and it originated from Postgres in the 1980s. Um, but Postgres actually removed uh, these time travel queries from uh, from their from their current product. Like as soon as uh, you know, people outside of academia started using Postgres more heavily. Can anybody guess why? Uh, well, so the reason why is because um, essentially what you have to do to actually uh, support time travel queries is you never throw away old versions. So you never garbage collect, right? So over time, uh, you're, you know, the more and more transactions that commit, um, your, your disk space will be uh, filling up very quickly uh, and eventually it will be full and probably very quickly depending on the speed of your transactions. Um, and the, the other thing is that time travel queries are not really needed by a lot of applications. Like you can't, you, you never really look at, you never go to a website and say like, okay, I want to know what this web page looked like three days ago. Not, not in most use cases. Um, but Andy mentions that like one 
a uh, common use case for these time traveling queries is in uh, the financial industry. Um, so the reason is because, uh, you know, due to, I don't know, you know, whatever, whatever rules and regulations they have to follow, they have to actually maintain the past seven years of transaction history. Um, so these uh, time travel queries actually allow them to uh, very easily query the database and figure out what, you know, sum of money, what their, what their total revenue was or whatever they want to look up, um, you know, over the past seven years. All right, so um, in the next two slides, we're going to go over two examples. Um, and what I really want to emphasize here before we start is that MVCC is independent from concurrency control protocols. So the purpose of these examples is just to basically show you um, how we, you know, update uh, versions and timestamps in the table, um, and also uh, basically like how, sorry, how we figure out which version, um, how we figure out uh, which version is to, is visible to the particular transaction, right? Which version of the tuple is visible? Is visible. Um, so uh, this first example, we'll see how this is going to work. Um, so right now, like the first thing to point out is that uh, now we have this version field, right? So we can see in this version field that um, it's assigned to A0. So this means object A, version 0, right? So um, we can assume that some other transaction uh, has written the value 1, 2, 3 to the database, and whatever traction, uh, transaction wrote it um, had a time, was assigned a timestamp of 0. And we'll go over why in one second. Um, so we also have a begin and end fields, um, and so these are just uh, timestamps. It doesn't matter if they're logical, physical, hybrid, as long as um, they, you know, they're always increasing and follow the other, you know, and I guess are, are valid timestamps, right, like you learned in the past few lectures. Um, all right, so... Let's begin. So uh, when a new transaction arrives, um, so we're going to be looking at transactions T1 and T2. So here T, uh, T1 arrives, and it's assigned a timestamp of 1, right? So now we're going to begin. OK, so for the first thing we want to do is we want to do a read on A. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider you know, uh, transaction 1's timestamp, which is 1, and we're going to take a look at our table and figure out um, which tuple is visible to it by, uh, trying to fi by finding you know, uh, where its current timestamp is between, the end and between beginning and end. So in this example, um, uh, the beginning is 0, and uh, the timestamp of 1 is between 0 and the end, which is infinity, right? So it's going to go ahead and read version A0, all right? All right, so now we have transaction T2, and we're going to assign it timestamp 2. Um, so the first thing we want to do here is we want to write A. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to um, create a completely new version of, uh, of A, which will be A1, right, because we're just incrementing the version counter. Um, and it's such a Right, and so what we're going to do here is the beginning timestamp is going to be set to the timestamp of T2. Um, the end timestamp will again be set to infinity. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to update the end timestamp of version A0 to also be a uh, timestamp of 2, right, for transaction 2. All right, so one thing you might have noticed that we're missing so far is like with with just you know the information that we had so far before we before this transaction status table popped up, the one thing that we're missing is that we don't really know the current state of the transactions in the database. So for example, you know the transactions here are currently active, but what if they aborted? You know, then you would have to go back and reverse the timestamps um, accordingly if it was aborted. Right, so as you can see, um, 
Here, we are, we're just gonna start filling out the transaction status table. At this point, both transactions are active. Then finally, we're gonna do this read on A. So what version is it gonna read? Anyone? Yeah. Right, A, A sub zero, because again, it's timestamp uh, still lies between uh, the beginning and end here. So it's gonna go ahead and read version A zero. And finally, it's going to commit. So at the very end, after this commits, then the then transaction T2 will commit. We'll update the status table, and uh, we can blow it away eventually. So for the second example, we're going to start with sort of the same setup, right? So we have transaction T1 uh, with a timestamp of 1. And in transaction T2, we're assigning a timestamp of 2. And it's the same state in the uh, in the database table, and um, so far we're just starting transaction T1. We're saying it's timestamp to one, and its status is active. So first, we're going to do a read on A. Um, I think at this point uh, it's pretty clear that we're going to uh, read version A0. And next, we're going to do a write on A. So again, just like in the last slide, we're going to create a completely new version um, and start in our database table where it's going to be version A1 with value 4, 5, 6, and the begin timestamp will be a 1, right? It will be whatever this timestamp is, and the end we will assign to infinity again. And the last thing to not forget is that we need to um, go up to A0 and assign the end timestamp to be the current timestamp of transaction T1, which is 1. All right, so now we're going to begin transaction 2. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is a read on A. So in this case, um, which transaction is it going to read? A1. Or sorry, which version is it going to read? Excuse me. A1? And why is that? Right, yeah. So I guess, yeah, so in this case, um, it's going to be, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot, about, yes. So one thing that we have to pay attention to, and this is a little tricky right now. Um, one thing I forgot to mention at the start is I, I understand you guys didn't have time to go over isolation levels. Um, so Andy wanted you guys to just review the slides and also the lecture from last year. Um, so I'm just going to provide some high-level hints for isolation levels for when you uh, go over those slides and the homeworks, right? But um, it might not make full sense at this point. But Basically, like at a very high level, depending on the isolation level you have, um, it may choose either uh, version A0 or A1. But let's assume it's sort of it's the uh, strict um, serializable, or excuse me, serializable isolation, which is sort of what you guys have been using up until this point. At this point, it will uh, it has to read A0 because A1 has not yet committed. All right, so now we're going to do a write on A. And so in this case, what's going to happen next? Um, well, again, here we have a write-write conflict, right? So uh, assuming we're using uh, 2PL, um, T2 is going to have to stall until T1 commits, right? So let's keep uh, this going. So now um, we're back to T1. We're going to do a read on A. And in this case, it's going to just read the same version that it wrote a couple minutes ago, right? And then it's going to go ahead and commit. All right, so now we can go back here, um, and we can go ahead, and now we're going to create the new version, A2, with value 789. We're going to assign it the timestamp of 2 with an uh, end timestamp of infinity, and we're going to update the end timestamp of A1 to 2 as well, right? So at this point, um, you know, whether, whether, the, whether T2 actually commits or not is really dependent on the... Uh, concurrency control protocol, as well as the isolation level. So that's something to keep in mind. But really, this, this example, the purpose of this example is just to show you how we um, update the object versions, maintain the transaction status table, and also figure out uh, which tuples are visible. All right. Any questions on this? All right, so as I mentioned, uh, a few, s oh, yes. So, like you said that in a previous slide that a writer won't talk a reader, right? So, when you are updating that version table, 
So don't you need to have locks on that table? Because what? like if I'm like uh, if I did a write and I am like updating a value, like I'm adding a final value too. And Are you talking about? Is reading it. So this right corner, right top corner table. If some I am a writer and I am updating this table and somebody is reading this table, then don't we need to have locks on this table? Oh. Well, so this again, this is a very high level example right now. And there's actually, um, we're going to go into how you actually store this information later on in this lecture. So that should, an, like, so that, that will answer the question. Basically, it's in some cases, yes, you do need to consider locks. Um, it really depends on how you're actually storing this version information. So if um, if we don't cover it in a few slides, because there's multiple ways to do this, so I don't want to just list them all out now. If we don't cover it in a few slides, please uh, ask your question again. All right, so, um, so again, like MVCC or its variants are used in almost all new database systems. Um, and these are just, you know, some examples of the systems that use MVCC. Um, but what we really want to emphasize uh, for the rest of this lecture is that MVCC is a lot more than just maintaining the timestamps that I showed you in the previous two examples. Um, there's a whole bunch of other design decisions that you have to make in order to actually implement a system that supports MVCC. So we're going to go over those next. So what exactly are these design decisions? Um, specifically, it's what concurrency protocol you're going to use. Um, how you're going to maintain and store the different versions, which relates to the question that was previously asked. Um, how are you going to clean up the old versions uh, once they're not visible to any transactions anymore? Um, and how you're going to ensure that the indexes point to the correct version? All right, so the first thing we'll cover is... Uh, Skip that one. Okay, so th that's what I thought. Okay, so the first thing we're going to cover is concurrency control protocol. Um, right. So this is basically. Oh, I'm I'm looking at the. Sorry, I'm not used to this presenter view. My bad. Okay. Concurrency control protocol. This is this is our first consideration, right, for our design decisions. Um, so these are the concurrency control protocols that you guys have been studying for the past uh, two weeks and the past two lectures. Um, and again, when, uh, when you encounter a write-write conflict, you need to use one of these protocols, whether it be two-phase locking, OCC, or timestamp ordering, um, to figure out which transaction uh, should be allowed to write to that object um, and what isolation level you're running at. So we're not going to go into much detail on this since uh, you've just been covering it very recently. Um, so the next uh, consideration is version storage. Um, so for ver version storage, what we need to do is figure out uh, for, for a particular tuple version, what should actually be visible to us, right? So let's assume for now that we're doing a sequential scan on the entire table and we want to know where to find the version of a tuple that we want. So the way we're going to implement this is we're going to maintain an internal pointer field uh, that will allow us to find the previous or next version, we'll go into that more, um, for this particular logical tuple. So you can think of this as sort of a, a linked list where um, you, you know, you can jump on into, you jump on in and land on the head and then you can follow the, the, um, the pointers in the linked list to find all of the different uh, versions that are currently being maintained. So indexes uh, will always point to the head of the chain. Um, and, oh my god, I did it again. I'm so sorry, okay. Technical difficulties. All right, so um, indexes, like it says here, will always point to the head of the chain. Whether the head is the oldest version or the newest uh, version of that tuple depends on the implementation. Um, so there's different uh, approaches to determine how we're going to store these different versions. So we'll go more into that next. 
So the first and simplest approach is called append-only storage. All right, so uh, this just means that every time uh, we create a new version, we just copy the old version uh, as a new physical tuple in our table space and update it. Um, so then we update uh, pointers to say, here's the next version. And we're going to go over examples of all three of these in the next few slides. Um, so the next approach is called uh, time travel storage. And this is where you have one master version table um, that, that is always storing the latest version of the object or tuple. Uh, then you copy out older versions into a separate table that we're going to call the time travel table. And then at that point, you just uh, maintain the pointers from the master version of the table with the latest tuples uh, to, the to the time travel table. And so the last approach, which is uh, the one that Andy prefers and thinks is best, is called delta storage. Um, so you can think of this as a diffs in Git, uh, where instead of just copying the old version um, every single time and updating it, you're just going to maintain you know, a small delta of the modifications from the previous version. So we'll first go over an uh, example of the append-only storage. Um, so again, this is the simplest approach, and this is also what uh, Postgres uses. Um, so each new physical version is just a tuple, um, is just a new tuple in the main table. So let's say we have a transaction here that wants to update object A, right? So uh, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to find an empty slot uh, in the table space, and then copy the values from the current value of A, which is A1, right? That's the most recent value, uh, into that table slot. And then next, it's going to uh, copy the modified value into that table slot. And are we done yet? Not quite. The final thing we need to actually do is update the pointer to um, point from the uh, older version to the uh, newest version that we currently installed. Okay, so another aspect we must consider here um, in order to, to store these versions, so, oh, in this example, um, we, A is considered the uh, head um, of the version chain. And in this example, we're specifically ordering these oldest to youngest, right? So an alternative would be you can uh, order them youngest to oldest. So um, if, you, if you're looking for the newest tuple in this case, um, you actually you, you, uh, get to the point where you uh, get to version A0, and again, you have to follow the pointers all the way down to the newest version, A2. Does that make sense? All right, so, um, so like I just said, the uh, previous example used oldest to newest, um, but you could also use newest to oldest. Um, and there's performance implications and trade-offs for both of them, right? So with oldest to newest, um, all you need to do uh, when there's a new version is to just uh, append to the end of the version chain, right? This is very simple. Um, append the new tuple and update the pointer uh, to point to the, the newer version, from the older version to the newer version. And this is a really easy operation to do. But if you do newest to oldest, then what this means is that you have to add the entry and update its pointer to point to the old head, right? But now you have to actually update all of the indexes to point to your new version. Since again, like we said a few slides ago, um, indexes uh, always point to the head of the version chain, right? So this means a lot more updates in some cases. All right, so uh, for time travel storage, um, this is the next approach we'll cover. Um, and here we're going to have a main table that always has the latest version of each tuple. And then uh, we'll have another table called the time travel table. And uh, this is where we're going to maintain older versions and copy older versions as they get modified in the database, right? So for this example, um, let's say the transaction wants to update object A again, same as last example. Um, then we're going to copy A2 uh, into the free spot uh, 
in the uh, time travel table and then update the version pointer to point to the oldest version of tuple A. Then we're going to overwrite the master version uh, in the main table to be the new version value. And finally, uh, we need to update the there new version by. And then finally, we need to update uh, the pointer to point from the new version, A3, to the uh, version that we just installed in the time travel table, which is A2. Right? Yes? Is there one time travel table for each uh, object, or is it almost like an append table? Uh, it would be uh, an append table. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, now we'll move on to the, uh, the last uh, approach that we're going to consider, which is delta storage, um, which again, uh, this is used by both MySQL and Oracle. And like I mentioned, it's the one Andy thinks is the best option. Um, so what's going to happen here is every time you do an update, you're just going to copy the values uh, that were modified into this separate delta storage segment that you see over here. Um, so. To update A, uh, we're first going to update its version value um, into the delta storage, right? So we're going to copy over its value. So instead of storing the entire tuple, we're just going to we're just going to uh, create a delta that states, you know, which um, part, which attributes in the tuple were actually modified. So in this case, uh, there's one attribute, so that um, that was now reflected in the delta storage segment. Um, then we're going to update the actual value um, in the main table and also update the pointer uh, from the new value into our delta storage. So similarly, if we, uh, if we want to now install a new value, um, a new version, then we need to do something similar to the time travel table scenario, which is specifically we um, append the new version update the value again, and now we're seeing it's version A3, right? But, um, we, but we also need to update uh, the pointer from A3 to now point to the most current value, A2. And additionally, we need to update the pointer um, of A2 to point to the older version, now A1, same as the time travel example. So, when you want to uh, read an old version, what you really, ha what you essentially have to do is you have to replay the deltas to put the tuple back uh, into its original form. So, uh, in this case, if we wanted to, um, if we wanted to read a one, we would start with uh, the value of a three, and then we would uh, follow the pointer the a two, apply the delta in a two, and then apply the delta a one, and that would get us back to the original value. Right? Um, so this is another uh, good example of the trade-offs between reads and writes. Um, so reading old versions in the append-only approach is really easy, which is one nice thing about it. It's easy to implement, right? Um, because you just find the version and the uh, tuple is already ready to be turned. So in addition to being easy to implement, you also don't have to put the tuple back together. You don't have to apply deltas to get it back to its correct state. Um, but with delta storage, uh, writes are going to be much faster because we don't have to copy the entire tuple um, if we only make a change to a subset of the attributes. So, you know, if you just have one attribute like we do here, this is, you know, clearly a trivial optimization. But in many tables, you might have, you know, dozens uh, of, of columns, in which case this can matter a lot. Um, but again, yes, with the delta storage, the, uh, that is the benefit, but the uh, disadvantage is that you have to replay the deltas again to put the tuple back together into its correct value. Um, so one takeaway you can get from this is, like we mentioned earlier, um, Postgres, uh, Postgres will be pa faster for reads, right? Because, um, uh, well, Postgres will be faster for reads, uh, and the uh, and MySQL will be, will be faster for writes uh, for this exact reason. All right. Um,
So the third thing that we need to know about on our list is garbage collection. Um, so all of these old versions are accumulating as transactions are running and finishing, and at some point uh, we know that the particular version uh, is, not being, is not visible to any other active transactions, right? So what this means is uh, if you're thinking about the uh, table with the begin and end timestamps and the uh, timestamp version, it means that there are no active transactions with uh, timestamps that fit between that begin and end range, right, uh, from older versions. So at this point, we want to go ahead and garbage collect these versions in order to reclaim space. So two additional uh, things that we have to worry about are how we're going to look for expired versions um, and when it's safe to reclaim them. Uh, so these are topics that we're not going to cover in this class, but they are covered in the advanced class if you uh, do choose to take it. So there's two approaches that uh, So there's two approaches that uh, we're going to look at. Um, specifically, the first one is tuple level garbage collection, and the second one is transaction level. Um, so tuple level means that we're essentially going to do sequential scans on our tables and use the version timestamps and set of active transactions to figure out whether the version is expired. Right? If it is, then we go ahead and prune it. So the reason why this is actually complicated is because we not only do we have to actually look at the pages in memory, but we also need to look at the pages uh, that we've swapped out to disk. Um, because again, we want to vacuum everything, right? Um, so we'll go over vacuum, uh, background vacuuming and cooperative cleaning in the next slide. Um, so the second approach is transaction level, which we're really not going to go into uh, much detail about. Uh, but the general idea is that you have transactions that maintain their read-write sets, um, and you know when they commit, so the versions are, right, so um, in this case, you have the transactions, again, they're maintaining their read-write set, re read sets, so you know exactly when they commit, and thus um, you can figure out when they're no longer visible and can vacuum them. So the first, uh, we'll first go over an example of how uh, tuple-level garbage collection works. Um, so let's say uh, we have two threads running in the system uh, where, um, so transaction T1 is assigned a timestamp of 12, and transaction T2 is assigned a ta uh, timestamp of 25. And then over in our version table, you can see we um, have object, object A, which is assigned version 100, um, has a begin timestamp of 1 and an end timestamp of 9. Um, and then we have a few other versions in there for uh, object B. Um, so with vacuum, background vacuuming, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we have sort of a set of uh, threads that run in the back room, and they perform this vacuuming, uh, where they periodically just do a full table scan of the table um, and look for which uh, versions are reclaimable. Um, and it works with any type of storage here. So for background, so here, um, so you have a background thread uh, that goes into the um, that goes to the transaction uh, thread and and says what and it basically queries what the current uh, transaction timestamps are. So in this case, it's going to be twelve and twenty five, right? Um, then it's going to do a sequential scan on the table to figure out whether the tuples uh, would ever be visible to them, right? So would A one hundred be visible to them? Uh, hard to say because we don't know yet what they're reading or writing, but um, oh, I see. Okay, sorry. Let me back up. Um, so again, uh, sorry. In this example, we're just looking at the uh, time st at the beginning and timestamps here. So here uh, we gather the timestamps of 12 and 25 from these two transactions. And then we again look at the beginning and end timestamp. So they will never be able to use uh, A100 or B100 because the timestamp does not fall between 1 and 9. Uh, whereas they do uh, fall, well, the timestamp of transaction T1 falls between 10 and 20, so it could potentially use that, that value. And at this point, um, we know those two tuples are safe to reclaim, so we go ahead and do so.
Um, so one optimization here, um, let's see. Well, one obvious optimization here that we can do is uh, we can actually maintain a bitmap for uh, dirty pages. And so anytime you modify it, you can just flip the bit of the page that you modified. So again, we're, meaning to, we're maintaining a bitmap for all of the pages in the database, pages specifically. Um, if we modify a page, we'll flip uh, that particular bit, which indicates that that page is dirty. Um, so this you know, takes a little bit extra storage, but it's just a single bit for all of the pages in the database. Um, and anytime you want it, um, and so when the vacuumer comes around, it immediately knows which pages it actually needs to vacuum, right? So it will go ahead and vacuum that page and then reset the bit to zero. So vacuum vacuuming, again, is typically uh, ran as sort of a, a cron job um, that runs periodically. But in some database systems, for example, Postgres, um, you can actually invoke vacuum manually from the, uh, from the SQL prompt, for example. Um, and it also has uh, configuration parameters that you can set such that um, it will, the system will basically uh, start up a vacuum thread if it if over you know 20 percent of the pages are dirty for example so there's different way to implement this there's different ways to optimize it for different workloads okay so the other approach we're going to look at um, is cooperative cleaning Right, so, and this is basically uh, where the threads, um, as they're executing queries when they come across old versions um, that they know are not visible to anybody else, um, it's their job to actually clean them up as they go along. So again, these are, these are threads that are actually executing uh, transactions, um, they, and they're going to actually check the versions that they, um, that they traverse across, whether those should be um, whether those are be whether that space is ready to be reclaimed because they're not visible to any transactions anymore and if it is it will go ahead and reclaim that space um, so one thing to note is uh, if you consider uh, the two orderings that we discussed earlier um, oldest to newest and newest to oldest would would this approach work for both of those no right and why is that That's, that's exactly right, yeah. So in the case of um, newest to oldest, uh, you're not going to be looking at any of the old transactions, so you will actually never end up reclaiming those. Um, so it's important to note that uh, cooperative cleaning only works with uh, oldest to newest ordering. All right, so now we'll just go through a similar example here. Uh, so let's say that, um, that we have an index and transaction T1 wants to do a lookup on object A now. So it's gonna, again, it's gonna ha um, land on the head of the version chain, which is the oldest value, and then it's going to scan along until it uh, figures out which uh, versions are actually visible to it. Um, so if it recognizes a version that it's looking, um, if it recognizes that one of the versions that it's currently traversing uh, is not visible to any other transactions, um, then it will go ahead and mark them as deleted and reclaim the space. Um, and then at the very end, it must also update the index uh, to point to the new head of the version chain. So we'll just go through these steps. So um, here we find uh, the value. Right, and so we can see that uh, version A1 is, uh, can be rep reclaimed. And then we, and then we uh, recreate the pointer from the index to the new version head, right? So ordering is, is actually important here. And the ordering that's actually done on the, that's actually on the slide is, is not quite correct. So when, when you actually um, perform these operations, what you would do first is um, actually update. So the first thing you would do is mark them as deleted, right? But you're not actually reclaiming the space yet. The next important thing is that you actually update the index pointer to point to A2 before 
uh, physically deleting them, right, or reclaiming that space. Because otherwise, um, if you have other transactions running concurrently, uh, they might find um, an empty pointer that points to nothing. Yes? Um, so like with the worker thread, figure out like what's deletable by like, would there be like someone global they're able to like, track like what early is actually kind of and anything that ends like after that, it would be more to delete? Yes. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. So it's going to maintain some information so they can figure out. So it's going to know the set of active transactions and be able to compare those timestamps uh, with the begin and end timestamps that in the uh, version table. Correct. All right. So again, um, transaction level uh, garbage collection. Um, we, here we just maintain the uh, read-write sets of transactions, um, and we use them to figure out what versions are not visible anymore and then reclaim the space. And that's really all we're going to say about, uh, about transaction-level um, garbage collection. Um, so any questions on garbage collection or anything else up until this point? All right. So um, now we're going to move on uh, to the to our final topic, uh, design decision, which is index management. Um, so, as I mentioned before, the primary key index is always going to point to the head of the version chain. Anytime we create a new version, version we have to update uh, the version chain, or we have to update well. We have to update the index to point to the new head of the version chain, right? So this gets tricky when updating the primary key. Because now it's, it's actually possible that you could have two version chains for the same logical tuple. Um, the way you implement this is when, when, if you want to delete the primary, uh, when you want to update the primary key, uh, you do this as a delete followed by an insert of a new logical tuple. Um, and there's some bookkeeping you need to maintain. And, um, and you also need to understand like how and when to roll back when necessary. Um, but for secondary indexes, this is actually more comp uh, complicated, and this will be uh, what we'll talk a little bit more about. So uh, with secondary uh, indexes, the two approaches um, uh, we use um, to make sure that our indexes reflect the uh, the correct value in the version chain um, are to maintain a logical pointer. And here, um, so here you have some kind of false identifier for the tuple, or some kind of unique identifier for the tuple uh, that does not change. And then you have some layer of indirection, uh, an indirection layer that maps the logical ID to the physical location of the database. And anytime you update the version chain, um, you just have to update the indirection layer rather than actually updating every single index, right? Um, so the actual approach is, I think, was I used in some of the slides earlier, I think, um, which is to actually uh, use physical pointers, um, uh, which is when you just point directly to the head of a new version chain. So every time the version chain gets updated, you have to update every single index, right? So um, the difference between the physical, uh, between using physical pointers and logical is you basically have this indirection table and the benefit of the indirection table is that you do not have to update every single index every time um, you update your uh, version chain. So, all right, so in this example, um, We'll say we have a simple database um, and we're using a append only version chain, which is running newest to oldest, right? So for the primary key index, um, if I'm going to do a lookup on object A, then this will just uh, be a physical address, right? For the, um, for the primary key, uh, which will be just a page ID and offset. So you know which page to go to, and then you take the offset. That's typically what this is. Um, it's going to point, again, to the head of the version chain, right? Um, and anytime you create a new version, um, you always update that with the primary key, right? All right, so for secondary indexes, again, you could use the physical address. Um, but there's the same issue. Um, anytime you update the tuple, you have to update the secondary index to point to this. Um, and 
and you know this is again like this is similar to some of the de to sort of the delta storage idea that we saw a few slides ago um yes if you have one attribute or if you have one index or one secondary index then this is not a big deal um but it's very common for OLTP databases in particular to have many uh, to have uh, many sun secondary indexes on a single table. Um, so every time you update the version chain, you have to update all of those secondary indexes, which for OLTP you can imagine might be uh, 12 or you know a few dozen. Um, um, and this of course is expensive because, for example, if it's a B plus tree, then you, you know, are traversing the B plus tree, you're taking latches as you go, and then finally you have to apply the update. So again, um, like we said in the previous slide, instead of storing the physical uh, address in the secondary in index, um, we're going to look at two alternatives. So the first is to uh, just store the primary key, which is literally just a copy of the primary key um, as the value in the secondary index. So there's a physical address. There we go. Right, so here we're going to have um, the actual value that we're going to store in the secondary index is going to be a pointer to the primary key index. Um, so now when you want to find a tuple, um, you just get, you first get the primary key index out of the secondary uh, index. Um, and then you do a lookup on the primary key index just as you would uh, um, to figure out what the physical address is. And then uh, everything proceeds as in the first example with the physical address. Um, so anytime um, I update the tuple and the head of the version chain, um, you can just update the primary index and automatically updates all of the secondary indexes, right? So this is one example of um, logical pointers. Um, and this is what uh, MySQL does, and uh, Postgres actually stores the physical address. So. Question. Yes? Sorry, I actually forgot what is secondary index. Um, a secondary index, so you have your, your primary key index, right, which uh, stores like the key, the key for your immediate table. So your secondary index uh, is going to, I guess, be a reference uh, to that key. So, um, why not? Yeah, so in this case, so like if you, um, so if you have a table A, right, and um, the ID is your primary key, um, then maybe in table B, you have um, a reference to table A, to, to table A dot ID, right, A, the attribute column in that table, right, and so you might create a second, this is what's called a secondary index on that particular item. So if you want to think about something more concrete, you have a table of users, your user has an ID, um, your user has a list of items that it has purchased, um, so for each of those items, you might store the user's ID in, in it, or, you know, something to, it's just typically used for tracking. Okay. Any other questions? Hmm. I think I might be getting ahead of myself here. Okay. So the last approach, uh, which is also another example of using a logical ID, um, is basically you just have uh, some synthetic value that's like a tuple ID. So this would typically be a cow, you know, an incrementing counter. Uh, to serve um, as the tuple ID, and then you have a hash table that says how to map from that tuple ID uh, to the address. So, um, so basically, you're going to get the tuple ID out of the secondary index, right? Tuple ID address. Yeah. So you're going to get the tuple ID out of the secondary index, and then um, you're going to, and then you're going to figure out where the physical address is, and then. The uh, hash table here will point you to the location of the physical address, so you can read that value. And again, um, similar to the approach we looked at, uh, where we were just storing the um, primary the primary key index, um, this is another example of logical pointers, which means that if um, each time we uh, have a new version or each time we update the version chain, we can actually avoid um, 
having to update all of the secondary index, right? So we, the only thing we have to update in this case is the uh, hash table um, and the pointers. Does that make sense? All right, so um, this table is actually really interesting. Um, so this is a this is um, a table from a paper that was published by Andy and uh, a few other students, uh, I think a couple years ago. So what they actually did is um, they uh, looked at a number of systems. So they looked at some older systems, you know, like Oracle, Postgres, and MySQL, and they um, also looked at some much newer systems within the past ten years. Um, so, for example, like Hyper or NuoDB, uh, Hyper would be an example of an academic system. So they tried to get a variety of systems here, and, uh, and the table lists which of these design decisions each of these database systems makes. Um, so let's see if Andy has any exciting things. So uh, I guess he says the spoiler if you guys want the spoiler, um, is that, or the takeaway of the spoiler is that Oracle and MySQL, um, uh, the way they do MVC, they actually found, like Andy and some students actually found this way to be the fastest for OLTP workloads uh, specifically. Um, and they actually found Postgres to be the slowest. Although personally, as both the user of MySQL and Postgres, I like Postgres quite a bit. But I'm also not running, uh, you know, commercial database systems with uh, uh, production workload traces. So, you know, once you get at that scale, it probably matters a lot. Well, it definitely matters a lot. Um, so, okay, so this uh, brings us to the conclusion. So today again, we talked about multi-version concurrency control. And again, um, as you just saw in the past few slides, um, there's a lot more to this than uh, just figuring out, you know, what timestamps to assign um, and what versions are vis visible to the different transactions. Um, so, you know, of course, you need to figure out how to store the versions, how to update them, how to update the indexes correctly, um, and the other items that we covered here. Uh, so, right for next class, uh, just to, just as a reminder, don't come don't come to class on Wednesday because. Nobody will be here. Um, so you guys have next Wednesday off. And then I think the following week, Andy will probably be back, although that's not certain. Um, but we will start uh, logging and recovery. Oh dear, coming through with Michelle and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry. It's with St. Nas in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa, better yet. I'll be champs, stressed out, could never be sun. Rick and say jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam, the bones in the bushes. Say not spill a canteen. Crack the bottle of the say not, sip it through gold. You don't realize the drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people still alive. And if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.